Welcome my friends, as you start adding Pool 2 cards to your collection, your deck building horizons expand. Pool 2 is full of some incredible cards that actually spawn brand new archetypes of decks that you are going to be able to build, but it's also got its share of losers that are better left alone. We are going to be ranking all of these Pool 2 cards, pointing out the decks that they support, the sneaky combos that will let you wring the most value out of these cards, and which ones are the losers that are better left on the shelf. We have a lot of ground to cover, so let's get started with Agent 13 here. On reveal, add a random card to your hand. 1-2 stat line, also these cards are all in alphabetical order. We can play her very early to be able to see if and how we're going to incorporate this random card into our game plan. It could be incredible for us, it could be terrible for us. I've had them. These cards that she's generated save me in some games and then wreck me in other ones because she created something like Agatha, who then took control of my deck and piloted the deck right into the ground. So we're putting Agent 13 down into the C tier. Not a real standout one drop fairly limited use cases. Her home is in the hand size Devil Dinosaur Collector archetype, able to add a card to hand which buffs the collector, high hand size fueling the Devil Dinosaur, and she gets even better when you're able in pool 3 to add Quinjet, who can then make that card that she creates one energy cheaper. The final call out here is that she is one of the random effects that is actually able to create Galactus and Thanos, two cards that can be created, they're in the game based on these random effects, but they're not publicly available to be added to your collection yet. Next up is a Bucky Barnes. Oh, I love me some Bucky. A 2-1, when this card is destroyed, create the Winter Soldier in its place. The Winter Soldier being a 2-6, which is a great stat line for a 2-drop to have. If you have fed this to, say, Carnage, then you can have Carnage eat the Bucky, then the Carnage is going to be 4 strength. The Winter Soldier comes in at 6 strength. Angel thins from the deck as another 2, and you've created this tremendous burst of tempo on the board. Absolutely love Bucky. He is a mainstay of the self-destruction archetype, which in pool 2 is starting to hit its stride. Technically it exists in pool 1, but it really gets rounded out here in pool 2, and it gets even better in pool 3. We're putting Bucky up into the A tier. His value is undeniable. The advanced tip for Bucky is that if we go back to the Winter Soldier, the Winter Soldier doesn't have any ability, so it is going to be buffed by something like Washington DC and Cerebro. Very niche cases, but it's worth knowing. On to our next one, Cloak on reveal. Next turn, both players can move cards to this location. The 2-4 stat line is solid. It is solid enough to elevate the Cloak above a lot of the other movement cards. The movement deck is just really struggling right now in the meta, but Cloak is one of the ones that can kind of flex beyond just the movement archetype because of the 2-4 stat line. People like just being able to drop a 2-4 onto the board. He also pairs up nicely with Angela. If you really want to lean into creating the biggest Angela possible, you can fill up Angela's location with a bunch of little cards, move them over to Cloak's location, then keep on playing to Angela and buff her into just the stratosphere. Send her to the moon. We're putting Cloak in B tier here with the caveat that I think that I'm overrating the movement cards a little bit in Pool 2 because Pool 2 is the best time to be able to play Heimdall, but we'll get to that a little bit more when we have Vulture towards the end of the list. Now we're going to look in at Ebony Maw. You can't play this after turn 3 ongoing. You can't play cards here. Oh, oh, we have a lot to unpack. This is one of the most complex cards in the entire game. A 1-7 stat line. Obscenely efficient incredibly desirable, but it's really held back by these play restrictions. So the first half is active in your hand. It's just a, I guess I would call it a passive. You cannot play this after turn three. It's an absolute brick in your hand. And then when it's played to the board, it has an ongoing effect, preventing you from playing any other cards to the Ebony Maw's location. This is really going to slow you down and make you puzzle very carefully about where you're going to deploy him. He has enough value with that 1-7 stat line to be desirable to get played out there, and he has a great place in decks that are able to give him assistance, either through moving cards to his location, or providing some other buff, say through a claw. You can manufacture a situation where you do very well with Ebony Maw, and then you can really take advantage of that 1-7 stat line. Putting him into the B tier here, not ranking him higher because of that restriction in the beginning of being unplayable after turn 3. You have to deploy him early, and that's what really gives you the headache. Advanced tip is that he is favored in the Hella deck in Pool 3 because Hella is both able to discard him and then still get him to board after turn 3 if you've been holding him in hand or if you have played him early, Hella is spawning a lot of random cards to different locations and then he's going to be able to get that assistance to go above and beyond what the opponent had at that location. Now we are looking in at Hobgoblin. On reveal, your opponent gains control of this. Hobgoblin is going to sail over to the opponent's side of the board and nail them with this negative 8. 
able to just bury them, able to lock off a space for them to be able to play. If you are able to catch the opponent out, you can prevent them from being able to swing a location and it can be absolutely devastating. The Hobgoblin is so pivotal, but he's also so risky. If the opponent fills up the location that you wanted Hobgoblin to sail over to, which on turn 5 the board is starting to get fairly cluttered here in Marvel's Snap, uh, then the Hobgoblin is just going to stay on your side of the board and you've played negative 8 on yourself. It's almost impossible to recover from that. So because of how dangerous he is and the potential of backfiring on you, I'm putting him into the B tier. He gets much better if you're able to synergize something with him like a Spider-Man, or a daredevil to ensure that he's going to an open location but at that point if you are investing in another entire card just to put negative eight on the opponent there's probably something a little bit better that you could be doing he does currently live in the destroyer archetype which is seen as arguably the most powerful deck in the pool three meta right now so you're going to see a lot of hobgoblin once you break into pool three Iceman, this is an incredible card. On reveal, give a random card in your opponent's hand plus one cost. Control out of a one drop, one two stat line here. Play him early, one of the most devastating turn one plays. He can throw off the opponent's energy curve, break up their combos. His most powerful target out of the opponent's hand could be their five drop, turning it up into six and then locking them out from being able to curve the five drop into the six drop together. Oh, but he's just so good, and if you have ways to be able to reactivate him or activate him multiple times, all the better. Plug and play this one drop. You won't be able to see the impact all that much when the opponent plays their card. It's going to be set as the normal cost for you to be able to see, but just know that he's doing incredible work for you. Next up, Jubilee. Incredible potential out of this card, but I am very curious what you guys think of the tier list. Leave me comments down below. Am I misrepresenting a card? Is there a tip or a trick that I haven't called out? I'd really love to hear how you guys have been finding success with all of these Pool 2 cards. Jubilee, 4-1 stat line. Terrible level of power to energy ratio, but her ability is worth it. On reveal, play a card from your deck at this location. This is an incredibly niche case where we're able to thin out our deck, make our deck a lot more consistent. She is, of course, most powerful in a deck that has a very high energy curve. You're hoping to be able to pull out a 6 drop on the Jubilee location and then be able to amp up a lot of power. Maybe also if you have a way to be able to benefit from having multiple bodies on the board. Her dream synergy, of course, is with the Infinite spoilers for later on in the list. She's one of the Infinite delivery systems, which are oh so powerful. She also pairs very well with Odin. If she can pull Odin for free, Odin will automatically reactivate her to bring yet another card from your deck or you can just be playing her early and then hold the odin play odin on turn six and get yet another pull onto that location to be able to fill it up with all four cards and hopefully be able to surmount your opponent now killmonger 3-3 this man is single-handedly holding back zoo from taking over the meta which it did for a short time during the beta on reveal destroy all one cost cards he is insane absolutely insane throwing him up to the s tier can't say enough good things about killmonger he is so flexible plug him in be able to pop multiple cards on the opponent's side of the board mesh him up with nova yourself if you are running a deck that only has maybe one other one drop and then you're being able to distribute buffs to your side of the board destroy a couple cards on the opponent side of the board killmonger's three strength himself the swings that this card can produce are insane and he also fills in the backbone of the self-destruction archetype able to trigger destructions to make a cheaper death able to trigger the nova able to put control on the opponent's side while pinging off your own cards he is just absolutely incredible s tier and remains s tier all the way through into the end game meta Leech is up next on reveal. Remove the abilities from all cards in your opponent's hand. This means that they become completely cancelled out to the point that those cards would actually be buffed by, say, a Patriot or a um, Washington DC. Leech sounds like he has an incredibly pivotal ability, and he does. He will absolutely brick the opponent's hand for their turn 6 play, or if you're able to play him out earlier, all the better. Really, you have to play him early for him to be viable. And now it can bite you in a couple instances. If he cancels out the ability for a card, like say Ebony Maw, who had played restrictions placed upon him, you've actually made that card better for the opponent. Uh, the same thing for the Infinite, or say Giganto, you're removing the play restrictions, which are their ability. So it can bite you in a couple niche situations. 
Overall, in practice, I just don't like the leech. He is so weak in terms of the power return, and then coming in late in the game, I have not had good success with him, and I'm putting him down into the C tier. Frankly, I don't think that he should be good. Um, it's incredibly frustrating to play against, and there's really no counterplay around it. It's just taking away the interactivity and the fun of being able to combo your final turn together. And so I, I don't even want to see a version of Leech where he gets buffed to be more powerful. I want him just to just kind of stay like this and be on some fringe cases. You laugh when you see him and that's about it. We have Morbius up next, ongoing, plus two power for each time you discarded a card this game. Morbius is so much fun. He's here to flesh out the self-discard archetype. He does an incredible job of it. In pool 2, you don't have that many discard activations. You're still able to bring him up to a 2-6 potentially, which is a solid stat line for a 2-drop. He really becomes more powerful in pool 3, where you have more cards that are going to be causing discards. It is important to note that he operates differently than the collector. He is ongoing, so he can be buffed by, say, Onslaught. He can also be turned off by Enchantress. He also has a memory of all cards being discarded. So if you play him on the final turn, you'll still be able to get the credit for having those cards discarded. Whereas the collector has to be on board to see the cards added to your hand to get the buff. So just some nuance there for cards that otherwise appear to mirror each other. We're putting Morbius all the way up into the A tier. I love this card and we are putting him here in the A tier, especially looking forward into pool 3 where these extra discard activation cards are going to make that list much, much more powerful. Now we're looking at Nakia. Oh, the Wakanda Queen, how far you have fallen. The devs have kept on tinkering around with Nakia. She used to be absolutely everywhere, adding a plus two buff to your entire hand. Then they cut that down to just adding plus two to two random cards. Now she has settled on give the two leftmost cards in your hand plus two power. This gives you a little bit of onus in how you're able to set up your hand and try and get the buffs on the targeted cards that will be able to find extra value on them, like the Multiple Man, the Swarm, Deadpool, Human Torch, things like this. The thing is that her stat line is just so weak. Three cost for overall five power, even on a card that's going to be able to make duplicative use of that buff there's usually a better three drop to play in her place i'm putting her down in the d tier right now now if the devs follow through on some of the room the rumblings the rumors that they're looking at user interface to have targeted abilities and they make nakia a direct targeted ability she's gonna jump right up to b tier have a home in a couple different decks but right now i would advise you going into a lot of other three drops Following up on one Wakandan disappointment is another with Okoye. She is a little bit better in my opinion than the Nakia, but I still really don't like her personally. Her value as a 2-2 that's giving every card in your deck plus one is all right. She can be plug and play um, into a lot of different decks and especially in decks where you have the swarm that's going to be able to make multiple use of the buff or something else, uh, but still, I don't... Personally, I just don't like using her. Maybe D tier is unfair. Maybe she should actually be up in the C tier. Let me know in the comments. Is that too harsh on Okoye? Her value, if you play her on turn two, you will then get the draw off three, four, five, and six. If you play all of those cards, then her overall value is a two, six, which I said on Morbius was great. Um, so maybe there's a little bit more argument to move her up a little bit, but I just personally don't work her into any of my decks. Now we've got Rhino, a 3-3 on reveal, ruin this location. So he removes the ability of that location, turns it into the ruins. I don't like Rhino either. <laughs> we've got dud after dud after dud here. The problem for Rhino is that he's offering a great service, but he's doing so in a weaker way than effectively all the other cards that do so. He's able to fix locations that are problematic to your deck or are giving your opponent an outsized benefit. The thing is that Scarlet Witch does the same thing at a cheaper price point, Swarm does it at the same price point but also leverages some control against the opponent, Magic does the same thing but also gives you a turn 7 so you open up a lot of deck building options around that. Rhino is just too expensive. If he had a little bit more power, maybe I would want to go in and play him. I have played him in my Cerebro 3s list, a list that it's back is just broken by any uh, location that will change the power of cards plus or minus so you have to run all of the location fixing cards possible and rhino is one of them uh, but outside of that uh, don't ever touch the rhino next up is saber tooth three four very interesting card here when this is destroyed return it to your hand it costs zero he is 
the black sheep out of the self-destruction archetype. I kind of like trying to use him and he's here to help flesh out the fledgling self-destruction here in pool 2. Especially in pool 3, you're going to have a lot of competition for slots on that deck and Sabretooth really gets edged out. But if you want to be able to run him, there is an amazing way to be able to capitalize on his power. You play Forge on turn 2. Play Sabretooth on 3, that buffs him to a 3-6. Then you destroy him on turn 4, he comes back to hand with the buff. Then you play Moon Girl on 5, and then you have two copies of a 6 strength free card that you can play on turn 6 alongside any other 6 drop that you want. That's a lot of flexibility and a lot of power coming in on that final turn. If you've been able to generate some other value, say with the Nova and Carnage, you could be in an excellent board state out of that. Now Sandman, this is one of those super powerful, super interesting cards that opens up a brand new archetype. We're looking at a real control card here. Ongoing, players can only play one card a turn. Now sacrificing your turn four to play Sandman for only one power yourself is very hard to recover from. But if your deck is tooled to make advantage of only playing one card, potentially being able to influence multiple locations with each of your final turn five and turn six plays, and then if the opponent's deck is geared toward comboing a lot of cards together, you can make it up and be able to win some games. Pairing this up with the Storm that we're going to talk about later really does bring to life a control archetype here in Pool 2, and it could be very interesting. Pair it up with, say, Claw, who's hitting two lanes at once, the opponent is only playing one card, you're assuming that it's only going to affect that one location, and you can start to stretch your opponent just too thin to be able to stop you. Sandman is incredibly fun, putting him into the B tier for now. Up next, we're looking at Scorpion. 2-2 on reveal, afflict cards in your opponent's hand with minus one power. This is a plug and play two drop into effectively any deck, always able to get reliable power, doing effectively the opposite of a Koye. Really love squeezing Scorpion into a lot of lists. If you have an open slot, give him a try. I absolutely love this guy. We're putting him up into A tier just because of how flexible he is. Dirty little trick is pairing him up with Black Widow, a pool 3 control card that will put a spider bite in the opponent's hand, preventing them from being able to draw a card and then hitting them with the scorpion immediately after nerfing the power of the spider bite, which had been a 0 0 into a 0 1, so the negative 1. So the opponent has to play that negative power to their own side if they want to get card draw onto their final couple turns. Oh, it is just so dirty. Shang-Chi is up next, and oh my goodness, what a card. 4-3 stat line on reveal. Destroy all enemy cards at this location that have 9 or more power. Are you kidding me? The power swings that this guy brings for only 4 cost are insane. He single-handedly can keep you in effectively any match. I could play random cards and Shang-Chi and feel like if I'm smart in snapping and retreating, I think I could still be able to climb with it just because of how much power he brings and how much of a power swing he brings when he's actually able to connect. Putting him up into the S tier, it's, it's showing that being able to play cards that destroy cards on your opponent's side is really good. Shang-Chi, Killmonger, absolute kings of Pool 2. Now we've already alluded to a little bit of what this next card can do. Storm, a 3-2 stat line on reveal, flood this location. Next turn is the last turn. Cards can be played here. So she's going to flip whatever the location is to flooding. That gives you one turn to be able to follow up, and then the turn afterwards is going to be flooded, and no cards can be played there. They can still be added, though, with a movement effect or with a copy effect from a number of different of the, the niche cases out there. So you can still get help to Storm's location. And if you build your deck around this, you're leveraging a lot of control up against the opponent. I absolutely love it. She's very flexible. She gets even better into pool three as you get more cards that have these abilities to help her out. Right now, Claw is probably your best bet. Being able to play Storm down, you could, dirty little trick, is play uh, one of the Guardians of the Galaxy afterward to turn four, anticipating that your opponent is going to try and do their best to match Storm with that one turn chance to get in there. The Guardian scores for bonus power. The Claw then follows up later to make sure you win the lane. It is really fun to be able to play with this kind of control. The Pool 2 collection is starting to wind down, but we've got a couple more winners in it yet. Sunspot, a 1-1 at the end of each turn, gain plus one power for each unspent energy. Sunspot is the most popular one-drop unit in the entire game. Absolutely amazing. You're going to see him 
everywhere. Now he's not really one cost, right? He's absorbing extra energy to be more powerful. The thing is that it's unspent energy, so he's really helping your deck be more efficient, smoothing out your energy curve. You can intentionally funnel some energy onto him to be able to have some sneaky scaling if a location is, say, locked up with cards on both sides. The Sunspot can then outpace the opponent, so he has a lot of flexibility. It's interesting here. Being one cost and then the fragility of the one cost being able to be destroyed by Killmonger and Elektra honestly holds him back. I think he would be better as a two cost, um, but that is how he has been balanced out. I think he would still be good as a one zero, which shows why he's going up into the S tier. Plug and play, very similar to the Iceman. You can really never go wrong with a Sunspot. Next up we have Swarm. When this is discarded from your hand, add two copies that cost zero to your hand. Starting as a 2-3, these copies will be set to zero cost, but they will maintain the power of the swarm. So this is where if you can get Nakia to buff the swarm up to 5 and get it to copy itself, you get a lot of use out of that buff. The thing is that that is really inconsistent to get to happen. Swarm's value is tremendous though in boosting up the self-discard archetype, giving them another reliable target for discard effects, so they have the Apocalypse, technically the Wolverine, so that gets cut pretty quickly, and then the Swarm as well, meaning that the deck is a lot more consistent. It also marries very easily into the Apocalypse playstyle. You can play the free Swarm copies at the same time on turn 6 as you play your big Apocalypse, and you get a lot of flexibility just flooding the board on that final turn. Also synergizes really well with Bishop, able to gain power based on the cards that you play playing these free copies, means that you're going to get extra buffs out to the Bishop if you choose to go that route. The Collector is up next, what used to be my absolute favorite card in the entire game, and then they nerfed him in half. So he's no longer the build around me, I will carry you to victory champion that he was before, but he is still very interesting. When a card enters your hand from anywhere except your deck, plus one power. So he starts as a 2-1, he's able to scale up. If you're able to synergize him with the hand size deck, with the Moon Girl, the Devil Dinosaur, the Sentry, etc, etc, these cards become very efficient. He doesn't get out of hand the way that he used to, but he is still incredibly effective as a 2-drop and is synergizing with what are otherwise quite powerful cards. Playing that in in Pool 3 with the Quinjet that makes these created cards that are buffing the Collector also cheaper gives him this life in the end game meta. So the Collector coming in here into the B tier, he's also actually quite flexible. It was worth noting that he plays very happily in the self discard archetype as well, because discarding Apocalypse and Swarm also buffs the Collector. So you can form an extra happy, efficient engine piece in that archetype as well. And <laughs> the Collector is so much fun, guys. He is popular in the bounce archetype as well in pool three. You get Falcon and Beast able to return cards that you have played to hand, which is going to buff Collector, gives you flexibility on where you play the cards, reactivations on reveal abilities. So the Collector has a lot of life in him. Now for a showstopper, the Infinaut. The third highest win rate card in the entire game, 620. That's right, 620. A mind-boggling stat line. If you played a card last turn, you can't play this. Debilitating play restriction. It means you have to completely pass in a normal play of, flow of play. You'd have to completely pass your turn 5 to be able to play him outright on turn 6. The thing is, he opens up a whole archetype of decks that aren't trying to play him on turn 6. They have other ways to be able to cheat him out. You use infinite delivery systems like the Jubilee that we had here in Pool 2. As you get into Pool 3, you get a number of other options. We're throwing the infinite up into the S tier. He just does so much more than what other cards are able to do. I have honestly seen, <laughs> I have seen people win playing Sunspot and Infinite. That's it. Two cards. They put 15 energy into the Sunspot, and then they play the Infinite on the final turn, and they win. Now, what's the opponent doing that they lose to 35 total points out of the opponent? I don't know, but it is incredible, and that shows how potent both of these cards are and how deserving they are of being up in the S tier. Next up is the Vision, a 5-7 with the ability you can move this each turn. Well, each turn when he's a 5-drop in the normal flow of play is only once. Vision is interesting because he has movement in his name, but he doesn't really fit with the movement archetype. Sure, you can move him and then you're going to get a extra buff onto the Craven, but I don't think that's really worth including him. I'd like a little bit more value out of my five cost. And honestly, the movement deck is pretty packed. 
spaces on that deck are tight, Vision does a little bit better in my opinion for a control deck. If you're looking at Storm, she can lock up a location, you play Vision later, and he has the flexibility of zipping over to help out the Storm and win that lane on that final turn of the game. Uh, a lot of potential here, putting him into the B tier just because the 5-7 stat line is kind of lackluster, but the flexibility that he has provided definitely means that you should look into him. Now for Vulture, 3-3, three, three, when this card moves, plus 5 power. Alright, finally we get a real punchy piece for the movement deck. He is a critical engine piece for Heimdall, putting him here up alongside Cloak in the B tier. Not a standout archetype overall, but Vulture is a standout card in the archetype. Very efficient, able to quickly get out of hand. Your goal out of that movement deck is to be able to bounce him around a number of times, have Vulture be large enough to win a lane on his own, and then spread out the multiple man to have even pressure on the other lanes and hopefully be able to spread your opponent too thin so that they're not able to counter you in both of those locations. I really do have a soft spot for playing Heimdall in the movement deck, so maybe I'm overrating the movement cards a little bit, uh, but I definitely recommend giving it a try in pool 2, because that is where the deck is at its best. It doesn't benefit that much from the cards that get added in pool 3, whereas other deck archetypes get a lot more powerful, so if you want to give movement a try, pool 2 is the best time to be able to do it. I'm going to have a video coming out soon, breaking down my recommended pool 2 movement list. We've got some sneaky plays fitting in Killmonger and Nova on that list. If you want to see how it turns out, subscribe to the channel and you'll be able to be notified when that video goes live. Now we've got Warpath. This is the closing card for Pool 2. 4 5 stat line, but ongoing if any of your locations are empty, plus 4 power. Warpath. With this empty location, able to bring himself up to a 4-9 is a premium stat line for a 4-drop. Very effective, very flexible. There's some mind game potential here. You could, from the very early state, look like you are abandoning the location and that you're leaving empty to the opponent. Maybe the opponent doesn't fill in enough power there to really secure it. And then on that final turn, you swoop in and you cancel out the buff on the warpath that they thought you were committed to and you're able to win in that situation. So a lot of fun that can be had playing around Warpath. He also has a home in the Destroyer Archetype, uh, similar to the Hobgoblin. So you're going to see a lot of Warpath as you get into Pool 3. Very fun card, very effective. Plug and play for drop. So here is our final tier list for the Pool 2 cards. If you guys have enjoyed the list and the tips that came out along the way, then show some love to the video, liking, subscribing. That's what helps promote this to the rest of the community. Let me know what you thought of the tier list down in the comments. If you thought that I misrepresented one of your favorite cards or I missed potentially a sneaky combo that you can pull off, I'd love to hear how you are finding success with these cards yourselves. Subscribe to the channel. We're going to be working on putting out the Pool 3 version of the tier list as well. There's a lot more cards there, very advanced cards, and there are some incredible combos that can be pulled off so stay tuned for that one till next time thank you guys for watching and keep on snapping